It's really interesting to think about what DNA is because it contains the genetic information for all life on Earth. But the information is not in the letters themselves, it's in the sequence of letters. My interest in nanopores goes back to a lonely little drive up in Oregon. So I'm just driving along, you know, as we do, and dreaming about uh, stuff that scientists dream about. And then something happened up in my brain that made me pull off to the side of the road and start to make a sketch. That was the beginning for me of the interest in what we now call nanopores. Two years later, Dan Branton was visiting my campus and uh, we just chatting about a new way to, to make sequences of DNA. Could there be a simpler way? Dave uh, told me about his idea, which I thought was much better than any of my ideas. And uh, got so excited that uh, wanted to start work on it immediately. So it's like a threading a needle, uh, something everybody knows about. So imagine I've got a hole in a needle, okay? And I got a thread out here. Now that thread is just jiggling around. Suppose I have a voltage across that pore. Now the thread not only comes near the pore, it gets pulled through. By pulling the DNA through the interface, we've known the sequence of subunits in the DNA. Somebody said, oh, that's cold fusion. That'll never work. Why did I think it was not going to work? Uh, it's because it, it, it's a very demanding thing. You have to be able to thread a single strand of DNA or RNA, nanoscopic uh, targets, through a tiny hole and drive it through that hole. I asked Dave Deemer, Dave, if you can show me that the DNA or, or RNA is actually going through the pore, then I'm convinced and I'd like to come and join you. And they uh, executed those experiments and published them in a, a journal in 1996. Well, it's interesting to think about the reactions of our colleagues. Nobody believed it. Most of the individuals who you would ask about nanopore sequencing would say that it has zero chance of succeeding at the time. And so we were uh, swimming upstream. So our publication, uh, just kind of, you know, was interesting, you know, that's nice, but nobody really picked up on it. We had the field to ourselves for a 10 year period that nobody else wanted to pick up on what we had discovered. So in 2007, two guys came into my office on campus and they were two people involved in a new startup company. They thought that maybe the nanopore sequencing idea would work. They said, we want to license your patents. If you can get a handshake between academic science that is exploring and discovering new things and industry that can bring those new things out into the marketplace. That was very important. Basic research comes first, supported by grants, and then the uh, discoveries are given to the public by industry. We have succeeded in sequencing with a nanopore device, and here it is. And here's this little thing the size of a cell phone. That caught people's attention. The impact of nanopore sequence has really been uh, quite profound. Uh, for example, tracking fungal disease outbreaks in critical care units, 
or even the Ebola virus infections in remote locations. Then somebody said, let's fly this on the International Space Station. Kind of overwhelming, actually, to see the technology go from taking an entire year to be able to read at any level a DNA or RNA strand to the point where you're reading thousands and thousands of these molecules, millions, and doing it on a tiny machine, a tiny sensor, was astonishing to us. This is like hanging on to the tail fin of a rocket going up into, into space. And that's what it felt like. This is now beyond anything that we could do. So it's been a deep pleasure, a deep satisfaction. Mary Bell Chilton is uh, an amazing person. My mother is someone who is tremendously curious and she loves uh, to work on a puzzle. What is the ultimate uh, puzzle out there? It's, it's got to be the incredibly complex code of DNA. As a PhD student and a postdoc, I was intrigued by bacterial transformation a process for correction of mutations in certain types of bacterial DNA. You know, Agrobacterium, Agrobacter tumefaciens, the name tells you a little bit, right? Agrobacter means a plant bacteria. And then tumefaciens means something that generates tumors. These are little pimple-like things that you see on the leaves and on the fruit and things like that, little pimples. And uh, those are the little the tumors, they're, they're called galls. She really set out from the beginning to prove that agrobacterium does not modify the genes of its host plant. She thought that was a, a ridiculous idea that people were, were bandying about and set out to prove that that wasn't true and discovered, much to her surprise, that, that she was wrong and they were right and it does change the genetic structure of the host plant. That's really where the field of genetic engineering of plants came from. The agrobacterium cells contained a plasmid, and when we looked for parts of the plasmid in the transformed plant cells, at last we found that a small part of the plasmid was there. Once it became apparent that uh, agrobacterium knew, if you will, some secrets about how to modify DNA that we didn't know about, she began to wonder how we might be able to harness that and turn it into a, a technology that we could use to modify the genes of plants. So along comes Mary Del Chilton, who figures out with research that she did how to open up that round DNA and then insert into it genes of interest. Imagine that this agrobacter is like that drone and the payload is the DNA inside of it. It comes to the plant and then the Bacterium, you know, insinuates itself, its DNA into the plant, and the DNA then becomes part of the plant's genetic machinery. The numbers of food crops grown using this technology is, is, uh, is pretty amazing. So the typical grocery basket in America, the meat that you're eating, was raised on these transgenic crops that's the result of Mary Dell Chilton's work. The eggs that you eat was produced by chickens that were fed on a diet that is derivative of Mary Dell Chilton's work. The bread that you're gonna eat, the corn tortillas that you're gonna eat, your shirts that you're wearing, the pants you're wearing, is going to have that of Mary Dell Chilton and her colleagues work in there. There are billions of people around the world who deal with some type of, uh, of food insecurity at some level, and the potential uh, to address those needs, I think, is, is one of those things that um, 
that is the real importance of, of where this technology can, can lead us. Stakeholders, you and I collectively as humanity, we have a stake in this because these foundational fundamental discoveries, whether it is about vaccines or about how to deal with hunger or how to, uh, for example, put a man on the moon. We never know. When Mary Bell Chilton did her original work, she had no clue that there was going to be a public good because she's looking at it from the perspective of that fundamental question of how DNA does its business. You never know where uh, a particular type of research will lead us. Sometimes the things uh, that things that get studied today may take dozens or, or hundred years to become apparent why they're important. She's just somebody who's been tremendously fortunate to, to get to see the importance of, of her work be revealed within her own lifetime. She's, a, she's definitely a, a really remarkable individual, uh, and um, yeah, I know my whole family is tremendously proud of her. I never really had a title. Some people say, oh, it's Chicken Paul. I'm kind of noted as the chicken guy. I say both my research is Darwinian because I work with variation. My career has been the same thing. It, it just more or less evolved. And, you know, just another day in paradise for him. You know, that's where he wanted to be, and that's, you know, it's just the way it is. If you were a geneticist, you knew about the lines at Virginia Tech, and thus you knew about Paul Siegel. I grew up around chickens. I have a picture on my desk when I was three years old. I find them very enjoyable just to be around, to observe. They have personalities. It's really relaxing for me. We had white chickens, we had chickens with brown feathers, and I never could quite figure out why sometimes when the eggs would hatch, they'd have white ones, would have red ones, and this and that. So it, it really intrigued me as to what was happening. I didn't know anything about genetics. I just knew I was going to go to college because I was going to breed chickens. When people ask me, what got you into chicken genetics? And I tell them, I like chickens, I like variation, and I enjoy it, and I'm getting paid for it. And they look at me like I'm crazy. I mean, there's so many other things. How can a guy want to do this type of a thing and enjoy it? I was very lucky that I was in an ag school because when I first came, I had hatch funds. And that got me started. And then they also had the regional research projects from the USDA. I was part of the regional research project on poultry genetics. I'm an experimentalist. If I want to breed a big chicken, I'm going to go work for a company. I'm in a university, and I want to know why some are big and why some are small. He had an idea at the start of his career, which was to create specialized genetic lines that were selected in different directions. High body weight, low body weight strong immune response, weak immune response, and to conduct selection on the birds every breeding season over a period of time with the intent that he was going to study those birds. And he did study those birds over the course of decades of research. If you take the average of the low weight and the average of the high weight, the high weight at selection age, eight weeks, it's 12-fold difference. I'm trying to get an understanding of the biology and to train people that can go out and do these other things. He 
stuck with that idea over time for his own research. But then he allowed anybody who wanted to collaborate and make use of the genetic lines to explore their specific question. That's a gift. That's a remarkable thing. Paul is certainly a mentor to me. I mean, he taught the students how to think. Not what to think, but how to think. And uh, the students that he trained during that period of time I was there have all been quite successful. The genetic lines are definitely a foundation to understand many fields, nutrition, growth, development, health, animal welfare. We are our genes and we are what we eat, so that's the, the contribution is kind of understanding the, the basics, the fundamental tenets of how organisms grow and develop as a protein source of enormous importance around the world. And he has a huge appreciation for um, basic research and applied research. Other people have taken what I've done and done the production, but somebody's got to lay the groundwork. I think that the work that I did had an impact on food production throughout the world and on science throughout the world, feeding people. The federal government has to support this type of work because it lays the basis for what's going on. Not only for the research, but for somebody like myself, who's trained a lot of graduate students that have gone to other universities, that have gone into industry. Without that, I wouldn't have been able to do it. The only job interview I ever had was the one here. I'm looking back from 1935 to the time I was three. That's all I ever wanted to do, and I ended up getting paid for it. You know, I, I'm a pretty lucky guy.